You're listening to the Fresh Hell Podcast. Fresh Hell contains stories of a disturbing and often graphic nature and is intended for a mature audience. Please don't let your kids listen to this or they might turn out like us. Hi, I'm Annie from the US. And I'm Johanna from Austria, and you are listening to your favorite international podcast. Ah, uh, sorry, I mean award-winning international podcast. How long can we keep milking this? I think like one or two weeks more, and then <laughs> and then it gets a little sad. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you so much for stopping by for yet another episode of The Freshest of Hells. And as always, we'd like to thank our new patron this week, Junior Roebuck. Thank you so much. Thank you. I would just like to add, if you are a member of the Murder Tier and haven't received your pin yet, please contact us via Patreon. There is absolutely no way for us to know if they arrive safely and we depend on you contacting us in case you're still waiting for yours. Yes, and I've just mailed out a batch, so some of you will be getting them soon. I would say if you don't get a pin in the next week or so, give us a shout out and just let us know. Yes. And also, quick reminder, please email us your spooky, creepy, bizarre, interesting, paranormal stories for our annual Halloween special. And you can send those stories to freshhellpodcast at gmail.com. Yes, and please, if you have sent us your story last year already, but we didn't read it in the 2020 episode, feel free to send it again, because I know we had like two listeners, I think, who sent their stories a little bit too late, and I wanted to file them for this year, but somehow I'm a horrible slob when it comes to our inbox. Hello, 267 unread messages. I'm just kidding. It's no, it's just much like higher. 60 unread much messages. Higher than that. <laughs> <laughs> I really fear I've deleted some messages, so... Sorry, please send them again. Yeah, you have our mailbox so organized, but I don't understand the system, so I'm afraid to touch anything. It's really sad, y'all. She just forwards me things, and then I have special folders that I go into, but I'm, otherwise I'm just afraid to touch anything, just slowly turning into my parents. But yeah, we're both, <laughs> we're both really behind in the emailing, and we're very sorry. We're going to get to it all, we promise. All right. I think that's all the, the business for now. And as we said last week, it is Spooky Fuckery Month, and so every episode is going to be sort of Halloween-themed. If you come here for murder exclusively, please come back in November, because you might be yes. disappointed. Last week, we discussed urban legends from around the world, and... See, I think we're getting progressively spookier, right? Because last week was urban legends, which are definitely not true. Today, we're going to look into cursed objects, which should not be confused with haunted objects. So, Annie, what's the difference between haunted and cursed objects? Is this a test? No, I mean, <laughs> seriously, just a quick explanation so that we know that we're all on the same page here. Yes, 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 yes. Well, just because I know there are people who are very into this, and I don't want to misquote anything, so we're going to go with my new favorite thing to quote, which is Wikipedia. And according to Wikipedia, quote, a curse is any expressed wish that some form of adversity or misfortune will befall or attach to one or more persons, a place, or an object. In particular, curse may refer to such a wish or pronouncement made effective by a supernatural or spiritual power, such as a god or gods, a spirit, or a natural force or else is a kind of spell by magic or witchcraft. In the latter sense, a curse can also be called a hex or a jinx. In many belief systems, the curse itself is considered to have some sort of causative force in the result. To reverse or eliminate a curse is sometimes called a removal or breaking, as the spell has to be dispelled and is often requiring elaborate rituals or prayers. End quote. Things are cursed by a living human. Things are haunted by a dead human right yes yeah that's actually a good explanation yeah oh by the way i did make a donation to wikipedia because i use it all the time <laughs> nowadays for like the beginning of searches or basic stuff so yeah that happened i went from i never use wikipedia <laughs> to sending them money so here we are so now we know what a cursed is and that an item uh, that is cursed would have a curse attached to it. This item is most often a stolen item, or if not stolen, at least it was taken under 
well, often violent circumstances, right? And it will now bring misfortune, disease, or even death upon the unrightful owner. We've mentioned curses twice, at least, I think, right? My fav- One of my favorite episodes, I realize that I'm maybe alone in this, but I still love our Tutankhamun episode. And also in International Tales, when we talked about the cursed palace in Venice, right? The Palazzo Dario? Yeah, sub ruina insidiosa geniero. I bring tre- treacherous ruins or something like that. Somebody wanted to have a t-shirt with it. <laughs> yeah, that should really be one of our like our mottos for the show, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so those of you who know me in real life or who are a member of our Facebook group might know that I am fascinated by precious jewelry. Tiaras, bracelets, necklaces, you name it, the shinier the better, especially the antique things. Oh, I could spend a year on Royal Street in New Orleans. But... If the precious do not only show an incredible craftsmanship, but are also part of history, or simply have a spooky story attached to them, that makes it even better. So it's only natural that I would love to open today's episode with a precious gemstone. And some of you maybe thought that I chose the Hope Diamond. I did drag my friend Sylvia there once uh, when we were in D.C. It's like, we just have to see the Hope Diamond. But no, that's not what we're going to talk about. You thought you knew me so well. But... To be honest, I thought about the Hope Diamond, but I think that one might get its own episode. There's a lot going on with that stone. Probably. (laughs) But today, I'm actually going to tell you about the Koh-i-Noor Diamond, another very famous precious stone. And I don't know if you're aware, uh, my husband loves to tell people this, but nowadays diamonds are not precious or rare. They used to be up until 1867, because that's the year when diamonds were found in South Africa, which was a huge impact on the world's diamond market. Because before that, diamonds were mostly found in Brazil and India, and then only in very small quantities. So diamonds were in fact very rare, and yes, very, very precious. Diamonds really were something that only the wealthiest of people could afford, even a tiny one. You know, you would never own a diamond, unless you were royalty back then. Kings and emperors owned diamonds. But a 15-year-old boy named Erasmus Jacobs found a, quote, pretty transparent pebble on his father's farm in South Africa, and everything changed. Now more diamonds are found in South Africa in just a couple of years than in the entire 2,000 years previous. And it's actually a really interesting topic. The only reason diamonds are not cheap as fuck is because companies, or I think it's just the one company really, isn't it, De Beers, very carefully control the diamond supply. They hold the monopoly pretty much on diamond mining. They're also the ones who came up with the A Diamond is Forever slogan. Actually, the person who came up with that slogan was a woman named Mary Frances Garrity, who worked as a copywriter at N.W. Ayers & Son, and she came up with one of the most famous ad slogans of all time late one night. A diamond is forever. And De Beers has used this slogan since 1948. They also pretty much came up with the idea of a diamond engagement ring and somehow managed to make us all think that this is an age-old tradition when it actually only started to be used regularly, really, in the late 1940s. It's such an interesting and actually pretty genius thing they did. Also, here a diamond engagement ring was really not a thing up until the last 20 years, maybe. Uh, again, we are so heavily influenced by the U.S. media. I think that's where where it came from with the diamond engagement ring. I think the history of engagement and wedding rings could be a whole podcast series, not even an episode, a series. Oh, yeah. As is the history of diamonds and the diamond market. It's so fascinating. Oh, absolutely. And there are a lot of great sources if you want to know more about this topic. For example, there's a book called Have You Ever Tried to Sell a Diamond by Edward J. Epstein. Also, the second season of the podcast, Fool Me Twice, gets into the history of the diamond industry. But that's not what we're here for today. We want to talk about cursed objects, and the koh is the first one. And the reason I digressed a little bit is the fact that this diamond was mined in India way before South African diamond fever. So... This comes from worldhistory.org, and they say, quote, The koh diamond, also the koh or the koh and I may have that all wrong, but that's my best attempt, is one of the largest and most famous cut diamonds in the world. It was most likely found in southern India between 1100 and 1300. 
The name of the stone is Persian, meaning mountain of light, and refers to its astounding size, originally 186 carats. Today, it's 105.6. In its long history, the stone has changed hands many times, almost always into the possession of male rulers. Like many large gemstones, the Koh-i-Noor has acquired a reputation of mystery, curses, and bad luck. End quote. All right, now we are talking. Mystery, (laughs) curses, and my favorite, bad luck. This diamond is the oldest still existing in a we-still-know-where-it-is kind of way in the world. And over the centuries, many, many rulers were in possession of this gemstone. And it seems that the jewel did indeed bring misfortune and even death to its owner. But only the male ones. Legend has it that in India, the diamond came with a warning, quote, he who owns this diamond will own the world, but will also know all of its misfortunes. Only God or woman can wear it with impunity. I mean. That's a really great curse. And the diamond really saw many rulers die an untimely death, and even empires fell, ceasing to exist. Here are some of those empires that failed, and again, apologies for the fact that all of these pronunciations are probably going to be wrong. The kingdom of Golconda, which is, I guess, its current day is the state of Telangana, India. The Kilchi Empire. The Talak Empire the Lodhi Empire, the Mughal Empire, Maratha Empire, the Kingdom of Persia, got that one, the Durrani Empire, the Afghan Khanate, the Sikh Empire, and all of them just fell apart just at the time that their ruler owned the Kohinoor. In 1849, the 11-year-old Maharaja of Punjab was handing over the Kohinoor to Queen Victoria The handover of this stone, considered the most valuable object of the Indian subcontinent at the time, was even part of the Treaty of Lahore. One passage read, The gem called the Koh-i-Noor, which was taken from Shah Suja ul-Mulk by Maharaja Runjit Singh, shall be surrendered by the Maharaja of Lahore to the Queen of England. The loot was then sent to Great Britain on a ship called the HMS Medea. Now, this ship seems to have been extremely unlucky. Once that precious sparkly cargo was brought on board in the shape of an iron chest, locked with four different keys. First, the crew was plagued with, well, the plague. The Black Death. I mean, there's a reason we use that term with things, don't we? And then, it almost sank when it was attacked by an enemy ship. And then before they arrived in Portsmouth, they even had to endure a typhoon. That's a lot for one ship. And I think we can almost hear the collective sigh of relief once the Koh-i-Noor was taken off that ship. In London, it was showcased at the Great Exposition in 1851. So many people stood in line to see the famous diamond to then ooh and ah at the symbol of Britain's imperial and colonial grip on the world. The arrival of the Koh-i-Noor ignited an explosion of quote, I'm doing like finger quotes, cursed Indian gemstone literature, and the possible curse of the Mountain of Light was heavily debated. Some were absolutely certain that the stone was in fact cursed and dangerous to men only, so it was great luck that Great Britain was ruled by Queen Victoria. Others were sure that it was all just scary stories, but on the contrary, many aristocrats even believed that the diamond was not cursed, it was actually a bearer of good luck. Prince Albert had the diamond recut into the shape that reflected the light and made it look more impressive, even if that meant that the stone lost almost half of its weight. It's incredible. Also, the sparkle that diamonds give off is called scintillation. Just a little bit of diamond trivia. Queen Victoria wore it as a brooch, and it soon became one of the most favorite parts of the crown jewels. And it's been passed down and changed into different iterations over the years, hasn't it? I think it was in the crown of Queen Alexandra, who was married to Edward VII, so Victoria's daughter-in-law. Queen Mary had it for a while, and then it finally, in 1937, came to the front of the crown that was worn by the Queen Mother, the wife of George VI and mother of Elizabeth II, the current queen. The crown was last seen in public in 2002 when it was resting on the Queen Mother's coffin, actually, for her funeral, and 
If, like me, you love jewelry, then you can go to the Jewel House at the Tower of London, and you can see the crystal replicas of the diamond set into the older crowns. And there's a glass model of the Koh-i-Noor that will show you sort of what it looked like before it was brought to England and recut. You can also see, like, the crystal replicas of the diamond at the Natural History Museum in London. It's a pretty impressive stone. The real question, though, is, is the stone actually cursed? And in a Smithsonian article, I read a quote by Richard Curran, and... It goes like this, quote, According to Richard Curran, Smithsonian's first distinguished scholar and ambassador at large, as well as the author of Hope Diamond, the Legendary History of a Cursed Gem, part of the reason these gemstones came to be perceived as cursed is because of how they were gained. Quote, When the powerful take things from the less powerful, the powerless don't have much to do except curse the powerful. Quote, Curran says. And I think, honestly, there's probably something to that. I think so, too. Okay, so this diamond is thousands of years old. I mean, he was found 2,000 years ago, and many people owned it already. Many powerful rulers in often unsafe times, you know, times of war or times of intrigues, for example. So I think it's obvious that many owners of the stone would die a horrible, untimely death. I would actually be surprised if we wouldn't find anything like this in the diamond's history. So that that would be more of a shock to me, right. right? Also, the time period. I mean, on the maybe there's no curse side, we have to remember that during this time period, a lot of deaths were horrible and untimely. Exactly. Yeah. 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 People weren't dying comfortably in their beds. <laughs> Also, I don't know, all the things the ship encountered on the way to England, is that even confirmed or part of the lore, you know? I mean... Do we really know 100% that this all happened? I mean, it said so on Wikipedia, so... (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I think I read one time that really no male British royal wore the Kohinoor so far. I don't know any. What do you think? Will Charles or William, will they dare to do so at one point? Or, I don't know, do you think the stone will be returned to India? Because I know that there is some debate on that as well, to just simply return it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, my feeling is it should be returned. I wouldn't be surprised if William makes some changes in that regard, maybe. But we'll see. I wish that all of the museums... I mean, I know it would be a logistical nightmare, but I really wish that all of the natural history museums around the world, for example, would constantly rotate and swap exhibits. Oh, that would be great, yeah. Wouldn't it be amazing? Yeah, everybody could have access to to all the things and see it. Yeah, wouldn't that be awesome? I do think that the part about the powerful taking things, especially gemstones or artifacts, and therefore the powerless cursing the powerful, I think there really is something to it. Mm -hmm. I really think... That's something to think about, actually. And I think that's the reason why there exist so many cursed jewels. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh, Another one that comes to my mind that is barely talked about is the Regent Diamond, which is another Indian mined diamond that was actually set in the handle of Napoleon's sword. And it can be seen nowadays at the Louvre. Yeah. So that's interesting. But I'd say enough of gemstones for now. I would like to tell you about the curse of Uluru, or how you might know it, Ayers Rock. And when I put together my notes, I realized that nowadays most people use the name Uluru, which is the original name given by Australia's indigenous people. But back when I was growing up, nobody over here had ever heard the name Uluru. We know the sandstone formation under the name given by the British, Ayers Rock. I started thinking, I had no idea when exactly did it change, you know, when did it change the name back? Mm. And is it nowadays even still okay to call it Ayers Rock at all? And I think it's important to learn things. I mean, I think our podcast is also, that's also something that we, you know, let's learn together. New we things. do that all the time in this in this show, you and I especially, trying to look up. Yeah. Yeah. And then I thought maybe there are some out there, you know, just like me, who are not sure and who didn't know why and when. So I decided to look it up and tell you about it just quickly, because then we know. And I found this on parksaustralia.gov.au, so the government site for the Australian nature parks. Quote, Australia's most famous natural landmark has two names, Uluru and Ayers Rock. And if I mean pronounce it, I'm sorry. Uh, I think apologies. I usually say Ayers, but it's probably different where you, wherever, however yeah. your accent is around the world. Yeah. So the quote continues, which one is correct? 
The rock was called Uluru a long time before Europeans arrived in Australia. The word is a proper noun from the Pichanchachara language and doesn't have an English translation. In 1873, the explorer William Gossi became the first non-Aboriginal person to see Uluru. He named it Ayers Rock or Ayers Rock after Sir Henry Ayers, the chief secretary of South Australia at the time. Ayers Rock was the most widely used name until 1993 when the rock was officially renamed Ayers Rock, Uluru, the first feature in the Northern Territory to be given dual names. In 2002, these names were reversed at the request of the Regional Tourism Association in Alice Springs and the rock took on the official name of Uluru, Ayers Rock, which it still has today. That means you can use either Uluru or Ayers Rock to refer to the rock. However, in the national park we always use the original name Uluru, end quote. So there you go, the more you know. Nice. I have never been to Uluru. I've only seen it from the airplane, which still was a very impressive view. Mm. But for those of you who decide to go there, here is a tiny warning for you. If you're going to visit Uluru, I know I don't have to tell you Hellions out there because you are amazing and um, you are people who always respect your surrounding, like we should do whenever traveling. But even if you are the most respectful tourist, there's something that many of us have done, something we maybe saw absolutely no harm in at the moment because we didn't know any better. But this something is now frowned upon in many places and I'm talking about taking sand, stones, seashells, pebbles or similar things from your vacation spot to bring home with you. And I'm the first to admit that I too have done it in the past, so I'm not judging at all. But I've since learned that it actually is a huge problem because while we think that it's just this teeny tiny amount of sand, for example, that we take home, it's actually a lot. It's a lot of people who just think the same. And to explain the magnitude of this problem, I'd like to quickly read to you a quote from totalsardinia.com before we get into the curse part of this story. Quote, The idea behind this project came after reading a newspaper article that said that if you put together all the sand from bottles found during luggage checks in just one summer, in just one airport in Sardinia, you would get several tons of sand stolen from local beaches. Not just sand, shells, pebbles, rocks, minerals and fossils are also taken away from the Sardinian beaches. And these figures don't take into account sand bottles that could be found in other airports or ports where there are limited security checks in place for cars and ships and no scanners are used. This means that cars are probably the place where the most items are taken away. End quote. I also have to say they have a project going on that's what this article talks about where people are asked to send back anonymously the sand they took from Sardinia. All right. So we can all imagine that this is a big eco problem and in some countries you can get fined or even go to jail if they catch you taking sand or stones from beaches. I think Hawaii has a campaign going on to raise awareness as far as I, I read. Uh, now coming to the cursed part. People don't only take sand from beaches, they take stuff from pretty much everywhere they go. I've even heard of people taking stones from ancient Roman or Greek sites. Please don't do that. And quite a few have taken rocks and pebbles from Uluru. But some would soon learn to regret it. And not because they got caught. Many visitors, once they returned home, would experience, let's just call it, a series of unfortunate events. And we know that because over the years the staff of the Uluru Kata Chuta National Park have received hundreds, and I mean hundreds, of parcels containing rocks, pebbles, sand, soil, twigs, leaves and apology notes. And in those letters the people described that they wanted to return the things they had taken from the land not only because they felt deep regret, but also they hoped that the curse they felt was on them ever since they took the objects would be lifted. So, for example, one tourist wrote, quote, When I received the rock, I was so worried that I want to return it as soon as possible. In just one week, my brother broke up with his girlfriend, my father went to hospital and he will do heart surgery on the 20th of January. Anyway, I just want to return the rock to its rightful place and say goodbye to the bad luck. End quote. That guy just sounds like a quitter. I mean, that's just like a <laughs> Wednesday in October in my life. Let's... <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Another one said, 
quote, on my trip home, my car was attacked by kangaroos. And you would love that, right? Uh, why does this never happen to me? Seriously, why? My car was attacked by kangaroos. Then it broke down. And all of the photos from my trip mysteriously vanished from my phone. Mm. End quote. Really? I think, <laughs> I think probably you did something to annoy the kangaroos who then broke your car. I wouldn't start a fight with a kangaroo. They are really, pff, they can be really scary. They're terrifying. I love them, <laughs> but they're terrifying. In fact, the park rangers have received so many packages over the years <laughs> that they even have a name for them. They call them sorry rocks. <laughs> Sorry. And Ron. as nice as it is to get the stuff back, there's a problem. The thing is, they are not only overwhelmed by the sheer amount of packages, but they also don't know where exactly this specific stone or, or this pebble, where did they come from? Where did the people take them? Yeah. As far as I understand, it's not so good to just put them wherever, because the ecosystem is very fragile, apparently. So what they do is they place these sorry rocks in a special neutral area and then they only use them when they find an area with lots of erosion going on. Right. Sorry, the sorry rocks is making me laugh so hard. I just keep imagining, like, this has never happened to me, but if you are one of these people in a very, very wealthy relationship and your partner buys you jewelry when you're mad at them... I hope you start calling them sorry rocks. It's a different kind of sorry rock. <laughs> Please. Yeah, but do you think that travelers do get cursed by taking something from Uluru? Mm. Well, I should preface this by saying, admitting, maybe. I collect sand. I have like a tablespoon or two of sand in little bottles from beaches I've been all over the world. But some of them I bought because some places, like I know Aruba, not Aruba, um, Bermuda. Um, people always want the pink sand, and there are schools, residential schools, for children and adults with various challenges. And that's one of the things that they do to raise money, is they bottle sand and sell it. So sometimes you can get your sand on the up and up. I don't know if I could quit. I'm the worst, God. I used to collect more rocks when I did mosaics as a hobby, but I still love sea glass. Is there a sea glass curse? Probably is. I think it's a really good campaign for preserving places of extraordinary, you know, natural beauty. I also know there's a really serious issue of people walking on Uluru. It seems like everyone has said, like, from the beginning, please don't walk on it. It's extremely disrespectful. Yeah. It would be like walking all over somebody's altar, right? It's just incredibly rude. But people wouldn't stop, and so they've now had to stop anybody from getting close enough to even attempt it. You know what I mean? I think those people should be more worried about a curse than like a random kid who maybe put a pebble. I think intent matters. Does that make sense? It probably does, yeah. Yeah. Probably I'm does. I'm open to it being cursed, absolutely, but I think that I think that whoever cursed it would understand someone being malicious or just not caring. Yeah. Versus just a whoops kind of situation. I think the best advice to not get cursed or fined or go to jail is, you know, I think we all know that saying, take only photos, leave only footprints, whenever you're visiting a nature site, right? Agreed. Oh, what about pine cones? What if you were in Lake Tahoe, allegedly, and you walked down to the lake, and on the road, like where cars were, there were a couple of huge pine cones. Is that, are they, never mind, I don't want to know. I'm just going to keep my haunted pine cones. <laughs> it's fine. Okay. What is next? Oh, speaking of roads, it's a car. Smooth. That was smooth. Right? <laughs> Thank you. I'm an award-winning professional. <laughs> uh, all right. Now, just like Jules, we also do find that cars often get a reputation of having been cursed, mostly when they were involved in a tragic event. For example, Archduke Franz Ferdinand's Graf and Stift double phaeton, which we talked about in the second part of the Habsburg Tragedies episode. Or, for example, Daniel Ricardo's 2018 F1 car. But I want to tell you about another car, one that most of you definitely know, or you've seen some photos of that car. And if not that, you definitely know its former owner, and that's James Dean. Yes, I'm talking about the Porsche 500 Spider that used to belong to James Dean. As most of you will know, James Dean was a Hollywood actor who only starred in three movies, many more TV shows before that, before his very untimely and tragic death at the age of 24. So sad. 
Mm. Now, James Dean was a car aficionado. He loved to own fast cars and motorcycles, and he loved to race them. And so one day, he bought a 1955 Porsche 550 Spider, one of less than 100 that were produced from 1953 to 1955. And people who were interested in buying one of these cars had to be put on a very long waiting list and to just hope that they would even be able to get one. You know, they had to keep their cool and hope for the best. <laughs> But, of course, if you are James Dean, you shouldn't have any trouble purchasing such a rare car. And he probably jumped right to the top of that waiting list, because that publicity, yeah. right? I mean, yeah, yeah. come on. And for all of you car lovers out there, I know several of you personally, so here we go. This is from supercars.net. Quote, at the 1953 Paris Motor Show, everyone got a first glimpse of the production-worthy 550. Its simplistic lines, scant interior, tiny windscreen, and purposeful engineering left little doubt toward the intended nature of the car. It was a refined, lightweight, and agile race car meant to outclass the heavier, less forward-thinking competition. And it worked. The 550 was built around a simple, tubular ladder chassis covered by a taut aluminum body refined by Ermin Comenda from the early prototypes. Sitting near the center of this was a complex engine which Ernst Furman designed to make the most of the 1.5 liters provided. Designated the Type 547, Furman's engine sat at the forefront of Porsche performance for over 10 years. Since its inception, the unit has pained every mechanic being somewhat over-engineered and overly complex. The Type 547 uses the same four-cylinder boxer layout from the 356, but in an entirely different way. To achieve maximum efficiency, the valve train uses a complex system of bevel gears and camshafts to offer a true DOHC setup per cylinder bank. This so-called four-cam setup was exceptionally difficult to set up, but allows for domed pistons and a better combustion chamber shape. Further adding complexity to the unit is a dual-plug ignition system that uses twin distributors of the intake cam. Both circuits could be controlled by levers from the cockpit. The engine also introduced a dry sump lubrication system, which was fed by a tank behind one of the rear wheels. This made the aluminum block relatively small and light. The engine gets its name from the distinctive double-sided cooling fan surrounded by an elegant shroud. End quote. I mean, no wonder James Dean wanted this car, right? And he yeah, got it. Yeah, we understood every single word. Every and... single word. My, our friend Kate, friend of the show and patron, hey Kate, she understood every single word of that. But yeah, we can assume that he was thrilled when he got it. And he was so proud to have this super rare, unique car. But there was something off. Because shortly after he bought it, he met with actor Alec Guinness and Sir Alec Guinness then wrote the following in his diary. Quote, The sports car looked sinister to me, exhausted, hungry, feeling a little ill-tempered in spite of Dean's kindness. I heard myself saying in a voice I could hardly recognize as my own, Please never get in it. If you get in that car, you will be found dead in it by this time next week. End quote. Jesus, man, that's heavy. <laughs> yeah, nowadays at age 42, I would probably get a bad feeling if Sir Alec Guinness told me that my car will kill me, <laughs> right? But at 24, I think I would have laughed it off, probably. I don't know. I mean, he wasn't Obi-Wan yet, so if Obi-Wan Kenobi tells you to do anything, you just do it, right? But back yeah, then, yeah. he was just Sir Alec Guinness. I don't know. I, I think yeah. he wasn't even Sir Alec Guinness back then, Not yet. right? No, 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 yeah. I don't think so. He was just Alec. He was just that nice young man with the handsome voice. Pretty eyes. I think this is a great place to pause for a quick word by our sponsor, Best Fiends. I have to tell you about Best Fiends, the fun puzzle game you can play on your phone or tablet. I love it because it's the perfect break from my true crime research. The puzzles are a fun challenge, but it's a casual game, so it doesn't stress me out, which is perfect these days because we're all a little stressed out. I love that there's always something new going on, whether it's a new challenge, fun monthly event, or just new levels. If you're bored with the same old puzzle games, then this is the game for you. It's just so much more than your average mobile puzzle game. The makers of Best Fiends have created a whole world right on my phone. It's bright and fun and colorful with great graphics, and there's a story about all these adorable characters. 
Trust me, you don't want to miss out on this game. So join me and millions of other people who are already playing this fun puzzle game. Download Best Fiends for free on the Apple App Store or Google Play today. That's friends without the R, Best Fiends. So yeah, James Dean, he's a 24-year-old superstar who, you know, had loads of experience racing cars. And at 24, you, you think you're invincible. And, and he yeah. laughed it off, right? Unfortunately, one week later, on the 30th of September, 1955, James Dean died in a car crash in his beloved Porsche 550 Spider that he had nicknamed Little Bastard. And what happened was he was driving the car down Route 466, which is now California State Route 46, and his mechanic, Rolf Wulterich, was sitting in the passenger seat next to him. The plan was for James Dean to get to know the car before he would actually participate in a race with it, which makes sense. Smart. Yep. So that day, he had already received speeding tickets for going too fast with the car. He was going 85 miles an hour, which is 137 kilometers an hour near Shalom, California, when a young student in a Ford Tudor made a sudden turn. And even though James Dean tried to use a racing maneuver called sidestepping to avoid the crash, he just couldn't. There wasn't enough time for him to properly react. It was an almost full frontal crash, and the Ford was catapulted 40 feet, or 12 meters, down the opposite lane of the road. Even though James Dean was not killed by the impact and people rushed to help him, there was even a nurse on site, but he was declared dead on arrival at Paso Robles War Memorial Hospital. Rolf Wulterich miraculously survived the crash with just a broken collarbone, and the student in the Ford was also just very lightly injured. The car, Little Bastard, was pretty much total, but nevertheless, it was bought by a man named Dr. William Eschrich, who found it in a salvage yard. He bought it to use parts of the car in his own race car, a Lotus 9. Whatever he didn't need, he gave to his friend and fellow racer, Dr. Troy McHenry. Eschrick crashed his Lotus in 1956 during the Pomona sports car races. He survived. His friend McHenry wasn't so lucky. He crashed his car in the same race and died from his injuries. What was left of James Dean's Porsche was sold to George Barris, who at first planned to rebuild it, which proved an impossible task. So he sent the mangled car on a tour. It was exhibited at car shows, movie theaters, and many other venues, before it was put in storage in early 1959. Only a couple of weeks later, March 1959, the car caught fire, and nobody really knows why. The good news was, it didn't suffer a lot of damage. Just the two tires that were left on the car had melted a little bit. And the other weird thing, the spider was stored with many other vehicles, but the fire didn't spread at all. No other damage was reported. Which, it's a little weird. Wait, why were there only two tires left on the car? Like, the other ones, the other two tires were destroyed in the accident? Or, or how yeah. do I have to? I do think that the they got pretty much destroyed in the accident. But I guess that when they did put the car on display on these different events, they probably maybe put new tires on. At least that's what I think, because we know that two tires melted and two tires were sold to a man who put them on his car. So... Who puts tires from a totally totaled car on his car, right? I don't... Yeah, that's, that really doesn't sound too safe. The tire thing is confusing. Yeah. And yeah, the man who bought the two tires, so apparently he was driving his car when, when you know it, both tires blew out at the exact same time and the car veered off the road. How accurate do you think? That story is told all the time, but is it... True, true. Like, is it verifiable? I think it's... Or is it lore? I think that's lore. Yeah, Like, I do honestly, too. it doesn't make too much sense to me. I know. It's a cool story, but... It's a great story. Could be true. Maybe. I mean, I guess, like, last week, it was definitely not true. This week, there's a lot of maybe yeah. trues, which is, like, it just makes it a little scarier. Because maybe, maybe it did. I mean, I can't imagine, like, hey, I bought the tires from James Dean car. I gotta put it on my car. I can see that happen. Yes. But... I could also see tires, I mean, tires can be expensive, so the car was pretty new, so the tires, in theory, should have been fine if they were inspected. I mean... Yeah, but... I Again, yeah. Well, listen, there are other stories of the I little I mean, look bastard. at the photos of the, of the crashed car, and I think the tires are, are pretty much done. Yeah. 
or it's just all completely fabricated. Mm, that would also make sense. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Who can say? But there are other stories of Little Bastard. Uh, one time it fell off a display, hitting a bystander, and apparently it broke their hip. Another time, the car allegedly fell off a truck and killed the truck driver, who was supposed to transport it to yet another exposition venue. And then, in 1960, it disappeared from a sealed box when it was transported from Miami to L.A. And even though there was an enormous reward on any tips that would help find the infamous car, it was never found again. Sorry to say that, but this sounds like a car from hell. Right. But then I say, what else can you expect from a car named Spider? I mean... <laughs> it's a terrible name. I know. Yeah. It's this, horrible. This car never... reminds me of Christine, I think. It's a lot. There's a it's lot true. going on with this car. It's, very it's a angry. lot. It's a whole lot of accidents and incidents for one small car. I mean, even taking into account that this is a race car and that its parts were sold to some racers, and racers have a higher probability of car accidents during races, I guess. But still, it's a it's a whole lot of fucked up things happening around this car. It's too much. I don't... You don't want to read that Carfax report. Do you have Carfax over there? There's like this, um... It's this company where you can search the VIN number of a car, and it'll tell you all the reported accidents that it's been involved in. But it's always like, check the Carfax. You know, but you just keep <laughs> we imagining. don't have that here. Yeah. Do you think it's easy to get insurance for that car? <laughs> I don't know. It's gone now. <laughs> I don't. I don't know. I didn't like that car one bit. That car was. It reminded me of. I had a car once that I was terrible. It was. A, we'll have to do a Patreon once and talk about the cars we've owned because it's pretty I, funny. But this car can fuck right off. Like seriously. Yeah, this car is a nightmare. All right. So we had a cursed gem. I think it's pretty easy for me to avoid owning a cursed piece of jewelry. <laughs> that makes one of us. I mean, I like, I have a lot of antique jewelry. It's not particularly expensive, but I love old jewelry. So the odds that something maybe <laughs> is a little cursy, eh, I'm just saying maybe. Then we had cursed rocks. Uh, we can also avoid those if we're mindful. Mm. A cursed car. I don't know. I doubt my Skoda station wagon is cursed. It's actually a lovely and very reliable car. But what about cursed furniture? I think we considered President Lincoln's chair to be haunted, if I remember mm -hmm. correctly, but I don't yes. think we talked about a cursed piece of furniture, because there's a difference, as you said in the beginning. That's right. And that's why I'd like to end the episode with a cursed chair. Thomas Busby's stoop chair, or the chair of death. Oh, it's so creepy. Chair of death. I'm ready. It was in 1702 when in North Yorkshire, a man named Thomas Busby brutally murdered his father-in-law with a hammer. Now what had happened? Thomas Busby had once met a woman named Elizabeth, and the two fell in love and the two married. But Thomas would often fight with his father-in-law. One day, Thomas returned home after a night out with his friends and he was stinking drunk. Completely wasted. He enters his home and finds his father-in-law sitting in his, that's Thomas, favorite chair. And a nice chair that was carved from fine oak. Thomas Busby didn't want his father-in-law in his house and he sure as hell didn't want him sitting in his nice chair. Well, he should have licked it then. <laughs> uh, is that just my sister and I? We literally used to lick this chair that was like the comfortable chair. Okay. <laughs> Did you never lick things to claim them? I feel like I mentioned this to Paul once and he looked at me like I was completely insane. I don't know. I grew up the first 11 years of my life. That's, as of a, course. Yeah, of course. Yeah, of only course. Child. Yeah. Yeah. We're two years apart and uh, I didn't have to lick things. Yeah. <laughs> we, used to, we used to lick things <laughs> to claim them as our own. So it was a nice chair. He didn't lick it. It was his chair in his house. Uh, I also read somewhere that he thought that the father-in-law had come to take his daughter back home. Whatever it was, I don't know. Thomas started to yell at his father-in-law. He, he was looking to start a physical fight. Elizabeth, too scared to intervene, was just watching in horror. But her father was smart enough to realize how drunk Thomas really was. And so he simply excused himself and walked home. Now, I know some of you might be able to relate, because I sure as hell can relate to this. I'm this kind of person who, when there's an argument and it gets too heated, I pretty much do the same yeah. as the father-in-law. I tell them, you know, this is not going to lead to anything productive, and uh, I too leave. Giving everybody, yeah. myself included, the chance to cool down. I think that's a good thing to do. 
some people understand, but others absolutely hate it. Because they think that I either don't take them seriously or that I try to win or that I run. Which none of that is true. Right. You're not going to get anything done if someone's just screaming at you. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, let's just revisit this when we can have But a... still, there are people who get very irritated and it makes them very angry. Yeah. And Thomas was one of those people. And he was fuming about the fact that Elizabeth's father had just left in the middle of his argument. So he grabbed a hammer. He ran over to his father-in-law's house. He entered the home and killed his wife's father with a blow or several blows to the head, which is horrible. Poor Elizabeth. And of course, it didn't take long and Thomas Busby was arrested and trialed for murder. And he was found guilty and sentenced to death by hanging. Mm. And on the day of his execution, he was asked if he had any last wishes or last words. And he asked if he could see his favorite chair one last time. (laughs) This is... Okay, fine. Now, I don't know if that is actually true or if it was just added to the story to make it more... I don't know. In my opinion, it's... It uh, feels like it was added to the story. Yeah, it's a very humorous thought that his last wish was to see his favorite chair. But okay, let's say it happened. So they either brought the chair to him or, which is the way the story is told more often, is that he was brought to the chair. Right. However it went down, they said, here's your, here's your favorite chair. Should we give you a minute alone with it? <laughs> and Thomas Busby looks at his chair and says, quote, May death come to anyone who dares to sit in my chair. End quote. Uh-huh. So he curses his chair. And then he's hanged. Uh, then he was dipped in tar. And then the tar-covered body was put in an iron frame and hung on the side of the road to warn other criminals. <laughs> Yeah, now listen, there are so many versions of this story, so many, almost as many as there are field barns in North Yorkshire. Some say that Thomas was not married to a woman named Elizabeth and that he didn't murder his father-in-law but his partner in crime, who he forged gold coins with. Some say he didn't even murder their accomplice, he was sentenced to death for coin forging, which, in my opinion, would explain the extremely harsh display after his execution, right? You want to really show other criminals, please don't forge coins. Whatever happened, Thomas Busby was hanged and now, of course, the landlord of Thomas Busby, an innkeeper, immediately uses the cursed chair to his advantage and he attracts all the looky-loos with it. Come look at the cursed dead man's chair and take a seat if you dare, oh, or boy. something like that. Yeah. The innkeeper even renames the inn to Busby Stoop Inn. And did people die, you might ask? Yes, they did. Or so people said. Many of those who sat in the chair ceased to live shortly after. Soldiers didn't return from war if they did take a seat at Thomas Busby's nice oak chair. From an article in the Northern Echo from 29th of October 2014, titled 18th Century Murderer's Chair Continues to Captivate Supernatural Fans. Quote, The chair remained in the pub for centuries and people were there to sit in it. In 1894, a chimney sweep who sat in the chair during a night at the pub was said to have been found the following morning hanging from a pole beside Busby's stoop. During the Second World War, Canadian airmen from the nearby skipton on Swale Air Base crowded into the inn and pub regulars claimed the airmen who sat in the chair never returned from missions. In 1967, two Royal Air Force pilots sat in it and while driving back from the pub crashed into a tree and died. A few years later, two builders were challenged to sit in it and within hours the one who sat in it fell to his death from a roof while a cleaner who stumbled into it while mopping later died of a brain tumor. Well, that's rough. Yeah. Just stumble into it. How much later though? Like... (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, also... I mean, the builder goes to a pub and then he falls off a roof. I mean, maybe don't drink while you're working, right? Yeah, I mean... In the 1970s, the pub's long-serving landlord Tony Earnshaw became so concerned about the chair that he moved it into the cellar. But a beer delivery man who had been intrigued by what an antique chair was doing there sat in it and minutes later was killed in a crash a few miles down the road. End quote. A vicar later declared the chair to be pure evil, and so it was decided that it should be donated to a museum, because this is what you do with dangerous (laughs) evil things. Just give them away. 
make it somebody else's problem. Best to a museum so many more people can enjoy the curse, you know? Yeah. It was donated to the nearby Thursk Museum, a museum that collects and displays objects that tell the history of Northern Yorkshire. But don't worry, the curator of the museum is actually a very smart man and he doesn't want anyone to fall victim to the cursed chair and so he made sure that no one can actually sit in it. And he did so by simply hanging it in a corner, which is a really smart problem solved. Yeah. Now comes a real bummer. Historians think that the Busby Stoop chair was actually made in the 1840s, so almost 140 years after Busby's death. Still, I don't know, I don't think I would dare to sit in it, even knowing that it's probably just a creepy folk tale, because, you know, better safe than sorry. It's hard to argue with that logic. Yeah, yeah, agreed. Haunted chair. There's there's a few haunted chairs, actually. I can think of a couple of haunted chairs that are coming up in future episodes, but, well, not haunted, cursed. I, I'm thinking of haunted chairs. This is a cursed chair. Yeah, there are more haunted chairs than cursed chairs, yeah. that's true. Because who curses a chair? Like, Well, someone who, you know what I just kept imagining? This is so terrible, especially if this is actually a true story, then again, I apologize for all the things I've done. <laughs> but that story, I just kept, have you seen the film Office Space? No. Oh, you have to see Office Space, but there's, and I'm blanking on the actor's name. He's so funny. He's so good. And he's completely obsessed with his red stapler. And again, some of you are going to get this, but he's just, have you seen my stapler? I just keep imagining him in the, this chair. It's just such an odd thing to be attached to, especially since it sounds like a really uncomfortable wooden chair. It's not even like the comfortable chair or yeah, we were laughing because we just found a picture of us as kids, like in those chairs. And I was like, oh, I know why we both wanted that chair. The TV was like, the screen on the television was smaller than my iPad. So <laughs> he wanted to be in the chair closer to the tiny TV. <laughs> Mystery solved as an adult. But yeah, fascinating. Good stuff. All right. Cursed objects, everybody. Th- that's it. Something good. <laughs> what do you have? <laughs> Uh, do you have anything? Yeah, my something good is that my husband home for five days only because he has to take some classes or exams and uh, yeah, he has to study. But hey, it's five days and he's sleeping at home. So that's a win, I'd say. That's amazing. It's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. How about you? Um, yeah, my sister is visiting this week. So we are going to be getting together with some friends, I think, at some point. And we're going out later on today to pick out pumpkins and finally get some porch flowers out. I haven't, I wasn't able to manage them all spring or summer, but it's fall and I've finally got it together enough to get some mums while they're 50% off because they're all almost dead. (laughs) Oh, I mean, well, but yeah, no, it's going to be good. If you enjoyed our show, we would be so grateful if you would leave us a rating and review if you have the time. It really does help other people find our podcast. You can find information on where to buy our merchandise, how to get in touch with us, our email, P.O. box, all of that stuff. You can find at our webpage, which is freshhellpodcast at gmail.com. And... Is that all the business? Don't forget to send us your Halloween stories. Yes, please. Also, don't forget to tell your pets that we said hi. The pretty ones, the lovely ones, the cute ones, the ugly ones, the foldable ones, the big ones, the small ones, the annoying (laughs) ones. Foldable ones. ones. All of the pets. (laughs) People in the Facebook group know what I'm talking about. It was International Day of the Dog, apparently. And thanks for all the lovely, lovely photos of your dogs that you posted. They are so precious. All of your pets are, and you have to cuddle them, treat them nicely, with respect, give them lots of treats, but make sure that they eat healthy otherwise. Uh, Also, (laughs) give your fellow human being the benefit of the doubt, at least once. If they're assholes, well, what can you do? But you tried. You tried. And that's it. Yeah. What else? Don't take sand from places anymore, or try not to. (laughs) Yeah. Please don't. Um, I feel like this list is just going to get longer and longer and longer. (laughs) Do make sure you look both ways before crossing the street. Please make sure to wear your seatbelt. And uh, yeah, if you're going through hell, keep going. Tschüss. Bye.